hello 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 guys welcome 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 to um an impromptu language paper two live okay so guys welcome 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 to uh an, a very 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 unplanned and impromptu language paper two live guys okay so i wasn't even sure i i'm gonna be so real guys i wasn't even sure i was ever gonna do a language paper two on tiktok when i did my paper one i was like that's it for the 2024 gang but guys again uh today i just happened to have an hour to spare okay um so guys Today, for the next hour, I'm literally going to be going over language paper two. For those of you who are keen beans and for those of you that really want to, you know, bring it home with this final uh, set of exams. OK, so guys, on Thursday this week, you guys are going to be doing your language paper two exams. First thing in the morning, Thursday. Guys, firstly, I want to mention that today's live stream is only going to be an hour, okay? I'm only going to look at question number five because it's literally not possible to do in an hour. All five questions and um, when I did my last live stream where I literally made it clear, guys, I'm only going to be on quick drive-by, drive-by. I got all of these complaints. Ah, it was too short. You didn't go into enough detail. Blah, 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 blah. All those keyboard warriors were just coming after me, coming from my hairline, coming from my neck. So guys, I really need you guys to be clear on the fact that I am going to do a one hour live stream today. The reason being, number one, I only have an hour to spare. But number two, tomorrow, guys, I'm going to be going live with Mr. Sally's on YouTube. OK, so for those of you that want us to go over language paper two, all five questions, head over to YouTube. We're going to go into lots of detail as to how to do well on all five questions. I even put up a poll the last, um, I want to say in uh, the past 10 minutes, my YouTube gang was voting. I basically put the poll and said, guys, what do you want us to cover specifically in tomorrow's live stream from 5 p.m.? That's why, guys, today's live stream is going to be a bit more brief, okay? I only have an hour to spare. And I'm only going to be looking at question number five, okay? So guys, today I'm going to be moving at a rapid pace. For those of you that want me to go over five questions, tune in onto YouTube tomorrow, okay? It's free. You literally just use the link in the bio and um, you can just go directly with that link onto the live stream that Mr. Sally's and I are going to be doing tomorrow at 5 p.m. We're going to go over all five questions. Today is another drive-by, okay? This is going to be a drive-by. So for those of you keyboard warriors who are like, oh, it's too short, it's too short, we're going to go into more detail tomorrow. Anyway, guys, let me stop waffling. Language paper two, let's begin. For those of you who are keen beans, right? You guys have, uh, I'm pretty sure today was maths GCSEs, right? I hope your maths exams went well. For those of you who are not too exhausted to get yourselves, you know, stuck in with language paper two, especially for those of you, you know, on YouTube, there's been lots of people saying, oh, I need paper two to carry. I need it to carry. I need to cook. I need to cook. Guys, I feel like cook, this word cooking or whatever is like the 2024 GCSE word. Last year was riz, right? People kept on saying riz this, riz that today or this year. It's cook, cook. Anyway, for um, I'm still trying to understand what this word cook means yeah however i'm gonna assume it's a good thing or a bad thing anyway I, I literally don't understand guys i'm too old however let's talk about timings for those of you who want to make sure you finish off the fourth and final english gcse exams strong you um really bring it home for those of you that need this paper to carry the previous three exams for English and you're feeling like, oh, I really, I don't feel like that paper two went well. I really need this to carry. Make sure you really get your timings down and between now and your exam on Thursday, download as many past papers, guys, practice and apply these timings. Guys, remember, you've got one hour, 45 minutes, same amount of time as language paper one. However, you're doing double the reading, double the writing, meaning... In terms of your timings, always spend the first 10 minutes of the paper reading the question paper, right? Or five questions, get a lay of the land. And then also the inserts, meaning by this stage, guys, you need to be very quick in your speed reading, okay? Because you're reading both inserts in the 10 minute window. Then for question number one, Spend a max of five minutes on this question and absolutely move on. Do not waste time on this question one multiple choice. It's worth only four marks, so don't waste time. 
Question number two, which is your first comparison question. This question asks you to write a summary of either similarities or differences, okay? So for this question, as it's worth just eight marks, spend 10 minutes on this question. The most important thing, guys, is you need to write at least one comparison paragraph, either talking about similarities in source A and source B or differences, depending on the question. Guys, remember that question number two is not going to ask you the same thing as question number four. People who think that they're trying to be really clever say, oh, I'm going to talk about exactly the same thing for question number two. I'm going to literally copy word for word what goes into question number four that is the worst thing you can do guys question two asks you totally different skills as question number four so don't do that then question number three which is the language question exactly the same wording and the same skills are tested as question number two in language paper one because you just simply need to find how the writers use language in a particular line num set of line numbers either in source a or source b it's just one source as this question is worth 12 marks spend 13 minutes on this question try to aim to write at least three peel paragraphs okay then question number four, your second comparison question. This question asks you to talk about the writer's perspectives. Very different to question number two. Question two is just simply a summary question. Question four, writer's viewpoints and perspectives. Also for this question, you need to think about methods, language and structure. And this question is worth 16 marks. So make sure you spend at least 17 minutes on this question, which leaves you... For question number five, which is what I'm going to be going over in today's live stream, guys, remember that tomorrow myself and Mr. Sally's are going live on First Rate Tutors YouTube channel. We are going to be covering all five questions, okay? So for those of you who are like, oh, how about question one, two, three, and four? I really want to go over question one, two, three, and four. Guys, I'm going to be going over that with Mr. Sally's tomorrow, okay? So all of you keyboard ninjas who are like, oh, I really hated her live stream. Her live stream only went over question number five. Guys, I literally only have an hour, so I'm only going to be looking at question number five like if you don't like it head off okay jog on for those of you who obviously are here for question number five let's get to it with question number five make sure you give it sufficient time 50 minutes minimum minimum if um if you can't do 50 minutes at least 45 minutes because it counts towards half of the overall paper's marks therefore it makes or breaks your grade you will be asked to either write a letter speech or article Meaning you need to show an awareness of form, but also, of course, you need to be able to write persuasively. Right. So this is persuasive writing. You are given what is called a topical issue. Topical simply means this is stuff that is, t uh, you know, society tends to debate. Um, are school uniforms, should they be banned? Are they good? Are they bad? Is education worth the paper it's uh, printed on? Um, are parents too overprotective? Climate change, is this a central issue or not? Travel, is it too expensive? Is it prohibitive? Um, social media and technology, is it good for us? Is it bad for us? All of that stuff are topical issues. Make sure you are aware of topical issues and have an opinion. And of course, you need to write persuasively for question number five. And that's exactly what I'm going to be going over. Guys, I'm going to be looking and reviewing Viewing the question five in this paper so guys just to be clear when I'm talking about timings by this stage you need to be very well versed in managing yourself through exams this is not the first time you're doing English ECSEs this is not the second time right especially for those of you that have done literature this is your fourth paper if you're doing both language and literature meaning you've done this rodeo many times and you know how quickly this one hour 45 minutes will go meaning you don't squander that time during your exam if timings is your biggest issue, guys, it's time to start working backwards. Secure the, those um, half of the paper's marks, those 40 marks for question five. Then go to question number four. Secure those um, 16 marks, then three, two, and one, okay? If timings is an issue for you. And as I said, guys, the first 10 minutes of your exam, read through the question paper. Have your highlighter handy. Make sure you also have plenty of pens, okay, to hand. And of course, when you're reading the question paper, you go, okay, so here I'm being asked, you know, read source A, lines one to 17. Four statements that are true and this one you just shade okay and then of course question number two right so this is like you should do this within a 60 second window right then question number two okay what does question number two ask me refer to source a and source b okay i always know that question number two is a summary question the ways the boys spend their time playing as young children is different so this is asked me to talk about differences use details from both sources to write a summary of the different activities of the boys guys i'm highlighting this just to show you guys how different question number two is to question number four if you think you're going to be clever and play the exam by using exactly the same response for question number two as question number four, you are not going to do well on this paper because it's not asking and testing you of similar skills, okay? Look at how question number four is going to be different. However, let's go and let's look at question number three. 
You need to refer only to source A. As I said, this question is a language question. You're given specific line numbers, just like question two in language paper one. In this case, you're asked how the writer uses language to describe his son. Okay. Also, the benefit of reading the questions before you read the inserts, guys, is because you are given lots of spoilers, okay? So you're having all of this stuff at the back of your mind. You are looking for these answers as you're going through each of the inserts. Then question number four, very different to question number two. This question asks you to look at both sources, right? Look at all of source A and source B. Okay, that's, that's similar to question number two, okay? You're looking at two sources. However, it tells you, compare how the writers, both of the authors, convey the different perspectives and feelings about the children growing up. And with this question, you're always asked to talk about methods. Guys, for those of you who think you're going to be really clever, you think you're eating or you're cooking or whatever, by using the same response for question two as four, you are literally fooling yourself. The only person who's going to be catching L's in that exam is you. Examiners are looking for different things for question number two as number four. Look at the wording here. You are told the writers, you know, the way the boys spend their time playing as young children is different. This is talking about a theme. You're being asked to write a summary. In contrast to this, you're being told to think about the writers, meaning what do you need to do for this question? You're thinking about writer's tone, writer's purpose, writer's indirect intent, connotations, all of that stuff comes into play for this question. So guys, for those of you that think you can be sneaky, oh, you know, I really ate in that exam. I did so well in that exam. I cooked because I talked about exactly question number two, question four. The only person who's getting cooked is you. The only person who's catching these L's is you. Don't do that, okay? Make sure you talk about distinct points and distinct differences in question two. And four. And as I said, guys, today I'm looking at section B. For those of you that want us to or want me to go over all five questions, tune in to my YouTube live stream with Mr. Sally's tomorrow. The link is in the bio. It is free. For those of you that want to know how to answer all five questions, we're going to be going live tomorrow from 5 p.m. Join in, ask any question, and we're going to go over all five questions. However, today I want to look at what came up in this paper. Don't pay too much attention to how I'm answering it. Obviously, pay attention to the response in case you do get a similar question or similar worded question on um, Thursday. However, pay attention to how I approach this question in terms of planning, in terms of making my perspective clear, in terms of integrating persuasive techniques, but equally in terms of how I present counter arguments. This is what you must incorporate into your persuasive writing. Here we're given a statement. This is the topical issue I am being asked to discuss. I've been told parents today, okay, so this is due with parents, are overprotective. They should let the children take part in adventures, even risky activities to prepare them for later life. Okay, interesting topical issue. Are parents too protective? Do we have an issue with helicopter parents? This is something that tends to be debated in society, okay? The other side of this type of debate is, are children a little bit too weak? Um, you know, uh, have we raised a generation of snowflakes? Um, maybe Rishi is right in sending a bunch of you guys off to war if he rewins this time's elections, okay? So here I'm being asked, write an article for a broadsheet newspaper in which you argue for or against the statement. Again, in this case, I need to also demonstrate an awareness of form, okay? So when it comes to articles, um, I need to make sure I start off with the headline, right? So headline, using keywords from this question, turn it into a rhetorical question, that's step number one. Then I need to have my opening paragraph. Then my main argument, I need to make it clear. Then my first subheading, right? So I'm going to put SH. And then my body paragraphs, BP, which is like, you know, reason one, two, and three from my perspective. Then counter arguments before I conclude. Now, what's my perspective on this uh, issue. Are parents today overprotective? I will agree. Guys, you don't get any extra points for agreeing or disagreeing. If you agree or if you disagree with whichever question comes up on Thursday, it doesn't matter. What matters is the strength of your argument. Are you able to come up with made-up statistics? Are you able to come up with counter-arguments? Are you able to give in those um, anecdotes? Do you have and have you incorporated things like rule of three, your made-up statistics? Guys, we call this having a mouthpiece. When you have a mouthpiece, you're able to talk to somebody who maybe doesn't see things from your perspective and you're able to not only shift them to your side but also make them see things from your perspective okay that's called having a mouthpiece and you need to have that mouthpiece in this part of the paper how do you approach this question okay so I decided I'm going to agree guys 
on Thursday, this is the best way to approach this question. As I said, I wouldn't actually spend 45 minutes on this question because this question is too important. I would actually spend 50 minutes. And then I would spend the first 10 minutes of this question, or rather this exam, or this part of the exam, planning. This time is sacred. If you don't plan and you just launch straight into the question, you're writing one paragraph, two paragraphs, what then sometimes happens is your structure becomes too loose. You're writing everything that comes in and your examiner can see that there isn't a robust structure, okay? Remember that the 24 marks you awarded here for content and organization, are you able to start your article, letter or speech in a clear and convincing way? Are you able to walk your examiner? Okay, take their hand, guide them through your argument. Are you then able to then guide them through the counter arguments and say, hey, this is why people will disagree with me, but, and then you finish off by saying, however, even if I've considered counter arguments, I still think I'm right. And then by the end, your examiner is like, oh my gosh, what a wonderful person. How, you know, they know so well, okay? So that's 24 marks, guys, okay? That's why I'm saying, spend the first 10 minutes of this paper planning. It is sacred because then when you're writing your response, you have a robust structure. You're then securing those 24 marks. Of course, quite, um, the 16 marks are for technical accuracy. This is your spag. This is your spelling. This is your ambitious language and vocabulary. So of course, guys, now... In the first, uh, so of course, I'm going to spend uh, 40 minutes of the remaining time um, writing my response, okay? Now, as I said, if I'm sitting this um, exam in your shoes as a year 11 student on Thursday morning, this is how I would plan. I'd literally draw a line down the middle. You're even always told you are advised to plan, okay? What would be my reasons, okay, for my perspective? Why do I agree with this perspective? Number one, definitely, I'm going to talk about helicopter parents, Helicopter parents are those parents who shuttle their kids everywhere. They're the ones who, you know, they closely monitor, monitor their children. They're always there, you know, they come in for school plays. They're the ones who are waiting at the school gates for their kids. You know, the kids can't be taking any old bus. They can't be taking any trains. However, could this therefore mean that these parents are too overprotective and they're not helping their children in later life? I am going to agree. And in this case, I'm going to give a made up anecdote. OK, arguing that, yes, um, you know, parents today are far too overprotective and they should indeed give the children freedom. And I'm going to actually say, you know, I'm going to give an anecdote, a made up example of a particular individual. I'm going to call her Sally Smith. Guys, for those of you that have tuned into any of my previous lives, you always know about Sally Smith, my made up anecdote um, woman or girl. And John Doe, my made up anecdote, man or guy. OK, so if you get stuck during your exam with your anecdotes, just remember the lovely and the wonderful Sally Smith and the lovely and the wonderful John Doe. OK, John Doe is going to be coming in my counter arguments. OK, anyway, so I'm going to say Sally Smith is year 11 student. Her mum is very overprotective. OK, she's very sheltered. And actually, you know, she's been sheltered from nursery. Hence, she actually will be very ill prepared for later life, she'll be ill-prepared for the vicissitudes, okay, guys, vicissitudes, grade nine word, guys, if you don't know what vicissitudes means, look it up, okay, at this stage, guys, you're taking charge of your learning, I'm not going to be answering and explaining every single word, this is a good grade nine term, maybe infer what I mean when I use the word vicissitudes when developing this paragraph, my, that's my first argument, why I agree. The second reason is actually, yes, you know, um, many children today, right? So this is, by the way, guys, this this is literally the topic, right? Dressed up in a slightly different way that maybe is driving why Rishi Sunak is saying, hey, um, once you guys get to uh, 18 years old, um, you're all going to be joining the national service. You're all too soft, okay? This is basically the other side of it, okay? Many children today are snowflakes because of overprotective parents, okay? Overprotective parents. Guys, I'm mentioning these examples because, as I said, guys, this question is actually easy to do really well on this question because it's simply talking about issues we hear about on the radio, on TV, these are issues that are not like dreamed up by AQA. People are talking about them on the radio, on TV and so on. So just have an opinion on this, okay? Now, in this case, I'm going to have my made up statistic. 
I'm going to completely make up a statistic according to Cambridge University. Um, you know, a lot of um, 80 percent of young teenagers, so 80 percent of students feel restricted by their parents. Yeah, the parents won't let them, um, you know, take part in adventurous, risky uh, activities. OK, and actually they feel like, you know, really um, smothered. Right. So they feel smothered. They can't breathe. They're like, oh, yeah, it's totally true. My mom is always there. My dad is always like checking what I'm doing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Third reason for my perspective, okay? So um, I'm also going to say one of the reasons why, you know, it's good for children to, um, for parents to be less protective is actually children who take part in, and I'm using keywords from the question, in risky activities and when i mean risky activities guys i mean like you know going out camping duke of edinburgh okay not standing on the op block um you know selling any type of packs or any any of that stuff guys what i mean by risky activities i mean stuff like doing duke of edinburgh right going on um huge excursions going to somewhere like south of france maybe for the summer learning how to speak and picking up a different language okay some parents see that as far too adventurous far too risky and you know they then say no 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 no, no. my kid you know they can't go camping they can't you know go to a different country and so that's going to be the risky activities guys okay so you know um going on um duke of edinburgh right doe maybe some of you guys have done duke of edinburgh maybe for instance going abroad for like summer school okay so summer school and um you know learning a different language right that's for some that's what i'm going to interpret as risky activities not risky activities meaning some extreme stuff okay not standing on no op block not doing any of that type of stuff and in this uh, case i'm going to give the example of duke of edinburgh yeah so doe and I'm going to say, you know, um, when kids take place, part in Duke of Edinburgh, even, for example, maybe debating club, debating clubs, summer schools, right? Actually, what that does is it teaches them independence in later life. Now, of course, guys, for any argument to be persuasive, you need to also show that you've considered why people disagree with you. A debate and a topic will not be persuasive if all you do is present a very biased perspective, i.e. you only show why you think you're right and you only consider your arguments and that's it, okay? You need to consider counter arguments, meaning, number one, why would somebody disagree with me, okay? So um, I'm going to consider why people disagree with me, why parents do need to be overprotective, okay? And, you know, so parents must be, so parents must be overprotective to prevent the kids um, from entering certain vices okay stuff like you know um drinking too early smoking all of that stuff and of course as i said guys i'm going to now use my other counter anecdote i'm going to talk about john doe in year 11 yeah this the other side of sally smith so his parents never let him um out as a child but actually he's now a very successful adult his parents never let him, you know, attend any sleepovers. His parents never let him attend any under 16 parties. But actually, you know, he's actually very successful. He's maybe an investment banker somewhere in the city. OK, when I say city, city of London. Second counter argument, which I'm going to consider is actually um, children should be. It's the parents' job to be um, protected. Actually, only irresponsible parents, so only irresponsible parents let their children engage in risky activities, yeah? So, um, and here I'm going to make up another counter statistic. I'm going to say, according to the government, gov.uk, they found that actually 75% um, of sheltered children the snowflakes were still able to cope as adults that's my plan done okay so that's my plan as i said guys you should begin the first 10 minutes of your exam for question number five on thursday planning your response draw a line down the middle literally think about your perspective and then counter arguments the counter arguments don't have to perfectly match your main body paragraphs but please make sure you try and have at least 
one counter perspective. Now I'm going to go into my grade nine response. Guys, again, for those of you that are like, oh my gosh, what about question number one, two, three, and four? I really want to go over section A. Guys, tomorrow on YouTube, myself and Mr. Sally's will be going over um, questions one, two, three, four, and five. Literally, the link is in the bio. If you're keen to go over all five questions, tune in tomorrow from 5 p.m. today. Literally, this is a very quick drive-by, um, meaning... I only have enough time to just do one question, okay? So that's why I chose question number five. Now, as I said, guys, because this is an article, I'm going to start off with my headline, okay? Your headline, because you're showing an awareness of form, needs to be short, snappy, and sweet. The easiest way, guys, to start a really powerful headline, look at the keywords in the question. So for example, parents being overprotective, turn it into rhetorical questions. Are parents too protective? That's it. And it's center. So if you get an article on Thursday, guys, put your headline right at the top, center, keep it to four or five words, turn it into a rhetorical question, done. Then I'll go into step number two of my article, my opening paragraph. This is where I'm going to show that I um, agree with this statement, but equally... I'm going to make sure that throughout my article, not only am I using persuasive devices, persuasive techniques like rhetorical questions, um, rule of three, long and short sentences, but also I need to ensure that my writing is engaging and entertaining. Guys, when you're answering this question, never start with, in this article, I will, in this letter, I will, in this um, speech, I will. That is boring. You are not making your nonfiction writing entertaining. An alternative way to do so is um, you can begin looking at the keywords and say, um, so present the counter view, right? So that's actually how I'm going to start. Um, there are many people today who think that parents should be overprotective. They should shelter the children, okay? Yet I disagree. That's how I'm going to start. Of course, also you can start with rule of three and so on. The only thing for this question, guys, is never start with, in this article, I will. In this letter, I will. In this speech, I will. Because that is boring. You are not making it engaging or entertaining. So I will begin by stating there. Ah, I'm showing the opposite view and then I'm going to then disagree with that to already create some friction, okay? We are always drawn to conflict. That's why I'm doing that from my opening paragraph. There are many people who believe that parents should be overprotective. They would applaud the efforts of parents who shelter their children from risky behavior. I'm engaging with all elements of the question, okay? So I'm mentioning all of these uh, words. I'm also going to talk about, you know, the adventure and this later life. They would agree that too much adventure for young children is irresponsible parenting yet now here i am switching i'm not going to show my perspective yet i disagree brief sentence so i'll start off with two long sentences or even three long sentences and now i'm switching the um, focus i'm now saying actually i disagree i am creating conflict parents today are damaging their children by being too doting, 
yeah doting parents our parents were like oh my god little eric oh my god little susan you're just such a little wonderful flower oh my gosh you're just so perfect let me just protect you that is doting parents right so i'm using that type of language i'm using my ambitious language okay so parents today are damaging the children by being too doting they are destroying their sense of independence this is damaging and destructive for their children's um futures they are destroying their ability ability to survive in later life that's my opening discussion guys once i'm done with the whole article i will then read it over step number one i've started my article with my headline step number two i have opened by showing my perspective but i've not launched straight into in my article i will tell you why parents today are too overprotective it's so bad blah 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 I've still tried to make it engaging. So step number three, after I've opened my headline, my opening paragraph, now I'm going to have my first subheading. Why is it good to have a subheading in an article? This breaks up the article. Guys, if any of you guys, um, you know, are following the elections, right, guys, for those of you who don't know, we are heading into elections, okay, general elections, guys. Obviously, all of you are probably too young to vote. But um, if you read any online article, if you're following what's going on, right, on all sides, okay, you've got Labour, you've got Conservative, Lib Dems, Green, whatever, right? You're going to notice the articles have headlines, right? If you read, for example, Guardian Online, whatever. Then you've got the subheadings on these online articles that break up the text. They do so to make it easy for your eyes as the reader to glide over the text. So do the same in your article. Say if you've got an article that you've got to do for your language paper two exam on Thursday this week. Hence, my first subheading is giving a preview of the main arguments for my perspective. OK, so actually I am going to use the term helicopter parents. This, by the way, guys, people use the term helicopter parents. It's an idiom, okay? Which means parents are always like, you know, the almost like the shadow of their child, right? Because they're constantly, you know, following them around. Oh my gosh, is my kid doing this? Are they safe? Are they safe? Are they safe, right? We call them helicopter parents. The other term is snowflakes, right? So this is when people are talking about kids being too soft. Oh, um, please don't say that. It's giving me anxiety. Don't say that. It's making me feel really sad. People say that these are snowflakes, okay? So I'm going to use that terminology. Again, when I'm using this terminology, I'm bringing my article to life, okay? So I'm fulfilling the primary purpose of this article, which is to inform, but equally the second pur purpose of this article, which is to entertain. So I'm now going to go into my first reason why I agree with this statement, okay? So um, this is, uh, and of course, I'm going to rely on my plan, right? So I'm talking about helicopter parents who do not prepare their children for the vicissitudes of life later on, okay? So um, I am sure you are familiar with someone either in your family or your extended family who has a mother that dotes on their son okay so obviously here i'm giving an example i'm also using the pronoun you to include my reader they are their child's shadow metaphor they pick up and drop them off to school they manage their child's time table they even 
do their homework. What have I done here? I keep on repeating they, 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 but I did it three times. I've used tricolon. Persuasive techniques. These are powerful rhetorical devices to use in your writing. Now I'm going to add and weave in my anecdote. Sally Smith is one such child whose mother is what we would call a helicopter parent. She, even if she is in year 11, she has never taken public transport. She is shuttled everywhere. Yet, this will be a huge disadvantage in later life. What will she do once she moves out and has to manage life, has to manage life alone in university? Her life will simply crumble crumble that's my first argument done i have made up my anecdote again guys i'm going to read the entire article once i'm done with my full article that's my first argument i've given my made up anecdote now i'm going to go into the second argument oh i've not actually used the vicissitudes so i need to use the word vicissitudes okay so i need to show off my ambitious word and my ambitious vocabulary i'm going to use it in the second point okay so this is um you know many children today are snowflakes um the other side of helicopter parents are snowflake children. They are unable to think for themselves. The smallest adversity, adversity feels like a mountainous ordeal. Their parents, their overprotective parents have made them unable to cope with the vicissitudes of life, right? So all the challenges of life. Now here, I'm going to talk about um, statistics, right? So, you know, lots of parents who don't let the kids engage in adventurous, risky activities. And here I'm going to talk about, you know, according to statistics, uh, a made up statistic by Cambridge University, actually 80%, you know, many children are overprotected, overscheduled. Um, actually, so that's what I'm going to do. Um, indeed, made up statistic, Cambridge University found that 80% of teenagers today are sheltered and overscheduled. They have never been allowed to engage in any risky or adventurous activities. This is, um, this is reprehensible, rep -re 
hen se bo. Yeah, so here I'm still criticizing parents who are far too overprotective. Now I'm going to go to my third and final argument from my perspective before I consider why people disagree with my perspective. To make my argument convincing and compelling, I need to show my perspective, but I equally, equally need to show counter arguments. Guys, even again, I'm going to talk about elections, okay? If any of you guys take the time to look at, you know, any upcoming debates, any, um, you know, election promises that any of the parties make, you will notice that they say, hey, this is why we're such an amazing party. Reason one, two and three. We're amazing, we're amazing, we're amazing. However, what they'll also say is, they will say, um, and I'm sure amongst you here today watching me telling this speech, you guys think we're not amazing because one, two, three and four. They consider counter arguments. Yeah. So effective debaters, even effective politicians must also consider why people disagree with them. That's why, guys, I'm saying you need to try and consider counter arguments, too. Before, of course, the, you know, the aspiring politician will say, oh, many of you seated here today, you know, disagree with me because of this, this and this. But then they finish off by saying, but I'm still right. Our party is amazing. Vote for us because of X, Y, and Z. OK, so if you guys want to know how an effective argument looks like, Literally watch any of the upcoming, you know, like speeches that any of the political parties are going to be saying in the coming few weeks before our actual elections and see how they not only present their perspectives, guys, but they always show why people disagree with them. That's effective arguing, not just one biased perspective. Anyway, now I'm going to go into my third reason for my perspective before considering counter arguments. OK, so, you know, um, why it's so good um, for kids to actually um take part in adventurous risky activities as opposed to having these super sheltered um, parent, you know, uh, super sheltered um, lives, okay? Um, uh, so uh, parents are too protective. They should take a step back. So they should take a step back. Parents... Um, if you are a mother or a father, so I'm here, I'm talking back to my reader, reading this, consider letting your child engage in adventurous and even <clears throat> risky activities right so here i'm using all the keywords in the question um you may balk right so you may balk at the idea of your son going to another country to pick up a new language you may be horrified. So here I'm giving the examples, right? These are the examples I was talking about. Um, you know, these adventurous, risky um, activities, Duke of Edinburgh, aboard summer school, debating clubs, all of that stuff. So I'm now weaving in my examples, okay? You may be horrified, horrified at the prospect of letting your lovely daughter lovely daughter roam the wild English countryside and camp in order to get a Duke of Edinburgh qualification. So I've given my examples, going abroad, um, DOV, right? Yet, it is these risky, adventurous activities that will prepare your child for later life. Children who are independent, become tomorrow's leaders. 
So that's all three of my arguments. However, before I go into my counter arguments, I'm going to add yet another subheading to break up the text and then preview what my counter arguments will be. Okay, so um, parents must protect. Second uh, subheading, okay, because it's an article. Now I'm going to go into my first counter argument, okay? So parents must be overprotective to prevent vices. Yet, now here I'm going to introduce people who disagree with me. We would call them naysayers, okay? A good word to use in your exam. exam. By the way, guys, the body paragraphs are what would go in. So say, for example, this was an article, this was a letter or a speech. The only thing that would change, guys, is instead of a headline and subheadings, you have like, you know, um, your address for your letter or just simply addressing your audience in a speech. But your body paragraphs are still going to be laid out in a similar way. You have your main arguments and then obviously your counter arguments, okay? Meaning using this type of language and terminology like naysayers, people who disagree with you, is still just as applicable as your, um, you know, in an article, a letter or a speech, okay? So as I said, guys, pay attention to how I lay out my argument how I develop my points, how I make it persuasive, okay? So, yet yeah, naysayers would contend, they would argue that parents must be overprotective. That is their duty. Um, otherwise, their children will pick up horrendous vices. They will smoke. They will drink. They will party. Um, parents should shelter their children. Indeed, now here, this is my counter example, my counter anecdote. John Doe would or, or agrees. He is a um, successful banker who had a sheltered child Hood. That's my first counter argument. But now I'm going to go into the second one. Um, others would say um, letting um, uh, would say. So now let me go back to my debate. So this is they should be protected. Oh, yes, yeah, so it's irresponsible. Um, parents who let their children engage in risky behavior are irresponsible. They would point to a study by my counter example, gov.uk, that found 75% of sheltered children still coped well in later life. They were able to establish themselves as adults. They landed high-flying jobs. Children need to be sheltered and protected. That's my counter arguments done, right? So I've considered why people disagree with me. However, now in my final closing, before I now finish off my article, I'm going to say, yeah, okay, I have considered these counter arguments. I have considered why people disagree with me, but I still think I'm right. 
Guys, when you're finishing off, do not say words like in conclusion. Do not say, in closing this article, I will. Because again, guys, you're still making it entertaining from start to finish. This is how to close an article, letter, or speech. You say this. That being said, yeah. So now here you're saying, on the other hand, yeah. So that being said, I still believe parents must take a step back. They are far too overprotective. They smother their poor children. We must let today's youth make their mistakes. They must be or become independent. They should engage in adventurous or even adventure and even risk. If you let them do that as their parent, they will thank you in later life. Done. So guys, as I said today, I'm going to be um, only looking at question number five. Tomorrow, myself and Mr. Sally's, we're going to be live going over question one, two, three, four, and five for language paper two. For those of you that want to do that last minute revision, tune into YouTube. The link is in the bio. So today, before I wrap up, I'm going to read how to respond to this type of question. But guys, as I said, focus on the fact that I'm using persuasive language. Borrow some of these metaphors. Use words like naysayers when you're considering counter arguments. Use ambitious language and vocabulary in your writing. Use anecdotes, use made up statistics. Okay, so pay attention to that, those um, techniques I'm incorporating and use it regardless of whether you're asked to write a letter, article or speech. Okay, this question is really powerful in testing your ability to debate, your ability to also show both sides of the argument. Now, this question, I'm, dis uh, I'm agreeing. So here's my headline. Are parents too overprotective? Headline done. Then, now I'm going to go into my opening discussion. Guys, pay attention to the fact that I'm not starting my discussion by saying, in this article, I will, because that's boring. I'm trying to still make it engaging. There are many people who believe that parents should be overprotective. They would applaud the efforts of parents who shelter the children from risky behavior. They would agree that too much adventure for young children is irresponsible parenting. Yet, I disagree. Conflict. Parents today are damaging the children by being too doting. They are destroying the sense of independence. This is damaging and destructive for the children's futures. They are destroying the ability to survive in later life. Pay attention also to the fact that I'm using a mix of long and short sentences, rhetorical question. I'm also using alliteration, metaphors. All of that stuff is mixed into your question number five. People think that, oh, I'm done with creative writing because I did language paper one, so I don't need any of that stuff. No, guys, you need to pick all that stuff up and use it in this nonfiction writing. First subheading, helicopter parents. So this is my arguments. I am sure you are familiar with someone in your family, so inclusive pronouns, or your extended family who has a mother that dotes on their son. They are the child's shadow, metaphor. They pick up and drop them off to school. They manage a child's timetable. They even do their homework. Sally Smith, my made up anecdote, is one such child whose mother is what we would call a helicopter parent. Even if she's near 11, she has never taken public transport, hyperbole. She is shuttled everywhere. Yet this will be a huge disadvantage in later life. What will she do once she moves out and has to manage life alone in university? Rhetorical question. Her life will simply crumble. By the way, guys, if you ask a rhetorical question and then answer it, this is powerful. We call it hyperphora. That's a really powerful rhetorical technique to use. The other side of helicopter parents are snowflake children. They are unable to think for themselves. The smallest adversity feels like a mountainous um, uh, ordeal. 
Their overprotective parents have made them unable to cope with the vicissitudes of life. Indeed, made up statistic. Cambridge University found that 80% of teenagers today are sheltered and overscheduled. They have never been allowed to engage in any risky or adventurous activities. This is reprehensible. I'm using ambitious language in my writing. Third reason for my perspective. Parents are too protective. By the way, guys, I hope you pay attention to the fact that I'm constantly referring back to the keywords in the question. I am signposting to my examiner. Hey, Mr. Examiner. Hey, Mrs. Examiner. I am answering the question. Look at all the keywords I'm using repeatedly. Parents are too overprotective. They should take a step back. If you're a mother or a father reading this, so here I'm using two um, opposites, right? Mother or father. Again, all of this stuff, oxymorons, alliteration, all of that stuff comes into play in language. Paper two, question five. If you are a mother or father reading this, consider letting your child engage in adventurous or, and even risky activities. You may balk, right? So when you balk at something, you're disgusted. Ugh. You may balk at the idea of your son going to another country to pick up a new language. So these are my examples. You may be horrified at the prospect of letting your lovely daughter roam the wild English countryside and camp in order to get a Duke of Edinburgh qualification. Examples. Yet, it is these risky, adventurous activities that will prepare your child for later life. Children who are independent... Um, who are independent become tomorrow's leaders. So those are my arguments. Now I've added another subheading to show I'm going to consider counter arguments. Parents must protect alliteration. Yet naysayers use this word when you're showing people who would disagree with you. Yet naysayers would contend, they would argue that parents must be overprotective. That is their duty. Otherwise, their children will pick up horrendous vices. Vices means terrible things, terrible habits. They will smoke, they will drink, they will party. Uh, rule of three, by the way, guys, I'm using triplet here. Parents should shelter the children. Indeed, John Doe agrees, my counter anecdote. He is a successful banker who had a sheltered childhood. Others would say parents who let their children engage in risky behavior are irresponsible. They would point to a study by Gov.uk, counter statistic, that found 75% of children, sheltered children still coped well in later life. They were able to establish themselves as adults. They landed high-flying jobs. Children need to be sheltered and protected. Those are my two counter arguments where I'm showing why people would disagree with me. I'm making sure that my argument is not biased. It's not one-sided. However, I'm then going to finish my article by saying... That being said, I'm not ending with in conclusion because I'm still trying to make it entertaining. That being said, I still believe parents must take a step back. They are far too overprotective. They smother the poor children. We must let today's youth make their mistakes. They must become independent. They should engage in adventure and even risk. If you let them do that as their parent, they will thank you in later life. I finished beautifully, I might even say so myself, by referring back to the keywords in the question. Guys, you cannot repeat the keywords enough, okay? So for those of you that are like, oh, I don't want to use these keywords too much. Uh, you know, the examiner is going to think I'm, rep I'm repeating myself too much. I'm repeating myself. No, guys. When you repeat these questions and these keywords, you are signposting to your examiner. I'm answering the question. I'm on job. I know what I'm doing. You are making their lives easy when they are awarding you these marks. So do use these keywords. And as I said, guys, I have shown you how to do so. Of course, you're not using those keywords every single sentence. Do it with finesse, but still do it. And as I mentioned, guys, when you're answering this, have a mouthpiece. Be a wordsmith. Make it engaging. Have your rhetorical questions. Have um, your made up anecdotes. All of these persuasive devices also come to play. Okay. So guys, um, oh, I've managed to finish on time. Oh my gosh. I'm so proud of myself. Oh my God. So guys, for those of you that want, I'm going to say this one last time before I wrap up. Language paper two covering questions one, two, three, four, and five is tomorrow. It's on YouTube. First rate tutors. For those of you that can't be bothered to search on YouTube for first rate tutors, I have put it in the bio on TikTok. I've made your life easy. If you can't do that, I can't help you. Yeah. So uh, like now this is down to you to decide whether you want to practice, join in and make sure you finish off really strong in this final GCSE exam when myself and Mr. Sally's go over this from 5 p.m. tomorrow. OK, so guys, thank you for joining in and see those of you who are going to be joining in the YouTube live tomorrow. 
nice and promptly at 5 p.m. Guys, I have to jet. I get to go. I'm going to try my best to upload this live. Um, For those of you that might have joined in a little bit late, I'm going to try my best to upload it to YouTube. I don't know if TikTok is going to let me download it, okay? Because TikTok sometimes just... It, TikTok be funny at times, okay? So sometimes I can download these live streams. Other times I can't. I'm going to try my best, guys. But um, for those of you who were super keen, keen beans, you want to finish off really, really strong on Thursday, join in from 5 p.m. tomorrow um so guys thank you so much for joining in um much love to you all take care guys and see those of you who are joining on on youtube tomorrow from 5 p.m take care guys